everybody. Oh man, sorry, I'm stretching. It's uh, time for chapter two of The Magician's Nephew. I hope you guys enjoyed the first chapter. I know I did. It's been a long time since I've read these books. And uh, we last left off. Degree and Polly were exploring the old houses in their neighborhood that are like completely connected, kind of like a big apartment complex, but they are individual houses. And they're all connected through the attics. Like you can't go from room to room from one house to another, but the attics are all the same thing. So they were trying to explore the empty house on the far side that no one lives in. They thought that they got to the very end and they went through the door. Turns out they were in the house that Diggory's stay staying in with his aunt and uncle, a brother and sister. Not his brother and sister, the aunt and uncle, brother and sister. And they go in there and it's his creepy, crazy Uncle Andrew's fancy study that he's not allowed in. And Uncle Andrew locks them in, then pretends to let them go, but gives Polly a parting gift of a very beautiful yellow ring. She puts it on, she vanishes completely. So now let's see where we go from here. Chapter two is called Diggory and His Uncle. It was so sudden and so horribly unlike anything that had ever happened to Diggory, even in a nightmare, that he let out a scream. Instantly, Uncle Andrew's hand was over his mouth. None of that, he hissed in Diggory's ear. If you start making a noise, your mother will hear it, and you know what a fright might do to her. That's right, Diggory's mom is sick and dying. As Diggory said afterward, the horrible meanness of getting out of chap in that way almost made him sick. But of course, he didn't scream again. That's better, said Uncle Andrew. Perhaps you couldn't help it. It is a shock when you first see someone vanish. Why, it even gave even it gave even me a turn when the guinea pig did it the other night. Was that when you yelled? asked Diggory. Oh, you heard that, did you? I hope you haven't been spying on me. No, I haven't said Diggory indignantly. But what's happened to Polly? Congratulate me, my dear boy, said Uncle Andrew, rubbing his hands. My experiment has succeeded. Little girl's gone, vanished right out of this world. What have you done to her? Sent her to, well, to another place. What do you mean? asked Diggory. Uncle Andrew sat down and said, Well, I'll tell you all about it. Have you ever heard of old Mrs. Le Fay? Wasn't she a great aunt or something? said Diggory. Not exactly, said Uncle Andrew. She was my godmother. That's her there on the wall. Diggory looked and saw a faded photograph. It showed the face of an old woman in a bonnet, and he could now remember that he had once seen a photo of the same face in an old drawer at home in the country. He had asked his mother who it was, and mother had not seemed to want to talk about the subject much. It was not at all a nice face, Diggory thought. Though, of course, with those early photographs, one could never really tell. Was there... wasn't there something wrong about her, Uncle Andrew? He said. Well, said Uncle Andrew with a chuckle, it depends on what you call wrong. People are so narrow-minded. She certainly got very queer in later life. Did very unwise things. That was why they shut her up. Back in the day, queer meant strange. So she became very strange. People thought she was crazy. Shut her up in an asylum, do you mean? Oh, no, 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 said Uncle Andrew in a shocked voice. Nothing of that sort. Only in prison. I say, said Diggory, what had she done? Ah, poor woman, said Uncle Andrew. She may have been very unwise. There were a good many different things. We needn't go into all of that. She was always very kind to me. But look here, what has all this got to do with Polly? I do wish you'd... All in good time, my boy, said Uncle Andrew. They let old Mrs. Le Fay out before she died, and I was one of the very few people whom she would allow to see her in her last illness. She had got to dislike ordinary, ignorant people, you understand. I do myself. But she and I were interested in the same sort of things. It was only a few days before her death that she told me to go to an old bureau in her house and open a secret drawer and bring her a little box that I would find there. The moment I picked up that box, I could tell by the prickling in my fingers that I held some great secret in my hands. She gave it to me and made me promise that as soon as she was dead, I would burn it, unopened, with certain ceremonies. 
That promise I did not keep. Well, then it was jolly rotten of you, said Diggory. Rotten? said Uncle Andrew with a puzzled look. Oh, I see. You mean that little boys ought to keep their promises. Very true. Most right and proper, I'm sure. And I'm very glad you have been taught to do it. But, of course, you must understand that rules of that sort, however excellent they may be for little boys, and servants, and women, and even people in general, can't possibly be expected to apply to profound students and great thinkers and sages. No, Diggory, men like me, who possess hidden wisdom, are freed from common rules just as we are cut off from common pleasures. Ours, my boy, is a high and lonely destiny. Uncle Andrew sounds like he's off his rocker, yo. As he said this, he sighed and looked so grave and noble and mysterious that for a second Diggory really thought he was saying something rather fine. But then he remembered the ugly look he had seen on his uncle's face the moment before Polly had vanished. And all at once, he saw through Uncle Andrew's grand words. All it means, he said to himself, is that he thinks he can do anything he likes to get anything he wants whenever he wants. Of course, said Uncle Andrew, I didn't dare to open the box for a long time, for I knew it might contain something highly dangerous, for my godmother was a very remarkable woman. The truth is, she was one of the last mortals in this country who had fairy blood in her. She had... She said there had been two others in her time. One was a duchess, and the other was a chairwoman. In fact, Diggory, you are now talking to the last man, possibly, who really had a fairy godmother. There, that'll be something for you to remember when you're an old man like myself. I bet she was a bad fairy, thought Diggory, and added out loud. But what about Polly? How you do harp on that, Uncle Andrew said. As if that was what mattered. My first task was, of course, to study the box itself. It was very ancient, and I knew enough even then to know that it wasn't Greek, or Old Egyptian, or Babylonian, or Hittite, or Chinese. It was older than any of those nations. Ah, that was a great day when I at last found the truth. The box was Atlantean. It came from the lost island of Atlantis. Atlantis is a mythological not according to this, country, continent, that was sunk under the sea like a zillion years ago. That meant it was centuries older than any of the Stone Age things they dig up in Europe. And it wasn't a rough, crude thing like them either. For in the very dawn of time, Atlantis was already a great city with palaces and temples and learned men. He paused for a moment as if he expected Diggory to say something. But Diggory was disliking his uncle more and more every minute, so he said nothing. Sometimes it's wise to not say anything, especially to people that are irritating you. Meanwhile, continued Uncle Andrew, I was learning a good deal in other ways. It wouldn't be proper to explain them to a child about magic in general. That meant that I came to have a fair idea what sort of things might be in the box. By various tests, I narrowed down the possibilities. I had to get to know some, well, some devilish strange people and go through some very disagreeable experiences. That was what turned my head gray. One doesn't become a magician for nothing. My health broke down in the end, but I got better. And at last, I actually knew. Although there was not really the least chance of anyone overhearing them, he leaned forward and almost whispered as he said, The Atlantean box contains something that had been brought from another world when our world was only just beginning. What? asked Diggory, who was now interested in spite of himself. Only dust, said Uncle Andrew. Fine, dry dust. Nothing much to look at. Not much to show for a lifetime of toil, you might say. Ah, but when I looked at that dust, I took jolly good care not to touch it, and thought that every grain had once been in another world. I don't mean another planet, you know. They're part of our world, and you could get to them if you went far enough. But a really other world, another nature, another universe, somewhere you would never reach, even if you traveled through all of space of this universe forever and ever. A world that could be reached only by magic. Well, here Uncle Andrew rubbed his hands till his knuckles cracked like fireworks. I knew, he went right on, that if only you could get it into the right form that dust would draw you back to the place he had come from 
but the difficulty was to get it into the right form. My earlier experiments were all failures. I tried them on guinea pigs. Some of them only died. Some exploded like little bombs. It's a jolly cruel thing to do, said Diggory, who once had a pet guinea pig of his own. How do you keep getting off the point, said Uncle Andrew. That's what the creatures were for. I'd bought them myself. Let me see, where was I? Ah, yes. At last I succeeded in making the rings. The yellow rings. Now that a yellow ring... Mm. At last I succeeded in making the rings. The yellow rings. But now a new difficulty arose. I was pretty sure now that a yellow ring would send any creature that touched it into the other place. But what would be the good of that if I couldn't get back, get them back to tell me where they had, what they had found there? And what about them, said Diggory? A nice mess they'd be in if they couldn't get back. You will keep on looking at everything from the wrong point of view, said Uncle Andrew with a look of impatience. Can't you understand that the thing is a great experiment? The whole point of sending anyone to the other place is that I want to find out what it's like. Well, why didn't you go yourself, then? Diggory asked him. Diggory had hardly ever seen anyone look so surprised and offended as his uncle did at that simple question. Me? Me? he exclaimed. The boy must be mad. A man at my time of life and in my state of health to risk the shock and the dangers of being flung suddenly into a different universe. I never heard anything so preposterous in my life. Do you realize what you're saying? Think what another world means. You might mean anything. Anything. And I suppose you've sent Polly into it then instead, said Diggory. His cheeks were flaming with anger now. And all I can say, he added, even if you are my uncle, is that you've behaved like a coward. Sending a young girl to a place you're afraid to go to your own self. Silence, sir, said Uncle Andrew, bringing his head down on the table. I agree with Diggory. Uncle Andrew was too scared to go himself, so he sent little old Polly. Oh, my Lanta. I will not be talked to like that by a little dirty schoolboy. You don't understand. I'm the great scholar, the magician, the adept who is doing the experiment. Of course, I need subjects to test it on. Bless my soul, you'll be telling me next that I ought to have asked the guinea pig's permission before I used them. No great wisdom can be reached without sacrifice, but the idea of me going myself is ridiculous. It's like asking a general to fight as a common soldier. Supposing I got killed, what would become of my life's work? Oh, stop jawing, said Diggory. Are you going to bring Polly back? I was going to tell you, when he so rudely interrupted me, said Uncle Andrew, that I did at last find a way of doing the return journey. The green ring brings you back. But Polly hasn't got a green ring. No, said Uncle Andrew with a cruel smile. Then she can't get back, shouted Diggory, and it's exactly the same as if you'd murdered her. She can get back, said Uncle Andrew, if someone else will go after her wearing a yellow ring himself and taking two green rings with him, one to bring himself back and one to bring her back. So here it is. Uncle Andrew, here's a picture of him. Oh, he has put Diggory in a corner now. He's vanished off Polly, and now Diggory is going to have to go in and rescue her. And now, of course, Diggory saw the trap in which he was caught, and he stared at Uncle Andrew, saying nothing, with his mouth wide open. His cheeks had gone very pale. I hope, said Uncle Andrew presently, in a very high and mighty voice, just as if he were a perfect uncle who had given one handsome tip and some kind of good advice. I hope, Diggory, you are not given to showing the white feather. I should be very sorry to think that anyone of our family had not enough honor and chivalry to go to the aid of a, a lady in distress. God, God, good grief! Uncle Andrew is such a turd. Oh, shut up, said Diggory. If you had any honor and all that, you'd be going yourself. But I know you won't. All right, I see what I've got to do. But you are a beast. I suppose you planned the whole thing so that she'd go without knowing it and then I'd have to go after her. Of course, said Uncle Andrew with his hateful smile. Very well, I'll go. But there's one thing I jolly well mean to say first. I didn't believe in magic till today. I see now that it's real. Well, if it is, 
I suppose all the old fairy tales are more or less true. And you're simply a wicked, cruel magician like the ones in all the stories. Well, I've never read a story in which people of that sort weren't paid out in the end. And I bet you will be too. And serves you right. Of all the things Diggory had said, this was the first that really went home. So Uncle Andrew's listening to something only because it has to do with him. Uncle Andrew started, and there came over his face a look of such horror that, beast though he was, you could almost feel sorry for him. But a second later, he smoothed it all away and said with a rather forced laugh, Well, well, I suppose that is a natural thing for a child to think. Brought up among women, as you have been, old wives' tales, eh? I don't think you need to worry about my danger, Diggory. Wouldn't it be better to worry about the danger of your little friend? She's been gone some time now. If there are any dangers over there, well, it would be a pity to arrive at just a moment too late. A lot you care, said Diggory fiercely, but I'm sick of this. What have I got to do? You really must learn to control that temper of yours, my boy, said Uncle Andrew coolly. Otherwise, you'll grow up to be just like your Aunt Letty. Now attend to me. He got up, put on a pair of gloves, and walked over to the tray that contained the rings. The only work, he said, if they're actually touching your skin. Wearing gloves, I can pick them up like this and nothing happens. If you carried one in your pocket, nothing would happen. But of course, you'd have to be careful enough to put your hand in your pocket and touch it by accident. The moment you touch a yellow ring, you vanish out of this world. When you're in the other place, I expect, of course, this hasn't been tested yet, but I expect that the moment you touch a green ring, you vanish out of that world, and I expect reappear in this one. Now, I take these two green rings and drop them into your right-hand pocket. Remember very carefully which pocket the greens are in. G for green and R for right. G-R. G-R-E-E-N. Green. You see which are the first two letters of green. One for you and one for the little girl. And now you pick up a yellow one yourself. I should put it on, on your finger if I were you. There'll be less chance of dropping it. Diggory had almost picked up the yellow ring when he suddenly checked himself. Look here, he said. What about my mother? Supposing she asks where I am. The sooner you go, the sooner you'll get back. The sooner you go, the sooner you'll be back, said Uncle Andrew cheerfully. But you don't really know whether I can get back or not. Uncle Andrew shrugged his shoulders, walked across to the door, unlocked it and threw it open and said, Oh, very well then, just as you please. Go down and have your dinner. Leave the little girl to be eaten by wild animals or drowned or starved in the other world or lost there for good. If that's what you prefer, it's all the same to me. Perhaps before tea time, you'd better drop in on Mrs. Plummer, explain that she'll never get to see her daughter again because you were afraid to put on a ring. By gosh, said Diggory. Don't I just wish I was big enough to punch you in the face? Then he buttoned up his coat, took a deep breath, and picked up the ring. And he thought then, as he always thought afterwards, too, that he could not decently have done anything else. And that's the end of chapter two. Who Uncle Andrew is a chatterbox. He talks a lot. But Diggory's off to rescue Polly, and hopefully those green rings work and bring them back to the present, or their world. Hopefully he can find Polly at all. But Uncle Andrew learned magic from a from his fairy godmother. Like an actual fairy godmother. Fascinating. Alright, that's the end of chapter two, guys. Uh, tell me how you're liking this. Uh, let me know if you think Uncle Andrew is crazy and creepy and all kinds of messed up because that's what I think but and tell me if you would have done anything different would you have gone after a friend to rescue them or would you have been like peace out I'm gonna go to dinner and I'll see you later see ya never Whew. anyways chapter 3 is called the wood between the worlds and we'll start that tomorrow so remember we got zoom meetings every Tuesday Thursday Friday at one o'clock and I'll see you then.